open close this, right? Yeah, you can close. Okay. Did you press live? Yeah. Okay, that's mean we are live. That's why we just wait for that. Good evening. Today we stand at the cusp of change and a moment in the history of our country that comes but rarely. A moment where the direction of the future trajectory of our nation will be defined. We at the Jeffrey Bava Trust hope that each of us, and particularly the citizens who are currently in positions of political authority, will think first as citizens of this country before any other personal affiliations when making the decisions regarding that future. We stand with the aspirations of the people to have a country that is just, equitable, and one that provides opportunities for all who are willing to pursue their dreams and aspirations. One in which none have to grovel before another to receive what would rightfully be theirs. We hope that tomorrow we wake up to such a nation. Friends, welcome to the much postponed 18th Jeffrey Barber Memorial Lecture. A few of us are gathered here today in the home of the late architect in Colombo, from where we bring you this live stream. Because we believe that conversations such as these must be shared to keep the spirit of humanity alive, even in our darkest moments. Let me start by apologizing for this last minute change of plans due to the very fluid situation on the ground here in Colombo. For those of you mostly in the west of the world, we hope you still catch the talk on our YouTube channel when you wake up. The Jeffrey Bava Memorial Lecture was started as a tribute to the great architect, where speakers have, almost, uh, have mostly been luminaries in the field of architecture from across the world, and now from nearly every continent. While they have come forth to share their thoughts and ideas with local audiences, we have also been able to share with them the experience of this extraordinary island and made links that connect us to the rest of the world. This year in particular, this, this year is particularly special as we welcome Sumaya Wali from South Africa, who is not much older than our brothers and sisters who stood, in, stood up to the excesses and incompetence of a moribund state on Golface Green to share with us her work emanating from her research in the inequitable urban realms of her own country. We are honored that she, in spite of the clear explanations of the situation on the ground, came to be with us in the hope of making what was to be her first live presentation after the pandemic. Sumaya, a very big thank you and welcome to Sri Lanka in what is hopefully the first of many visits to this island. All this would not have been possible if not for a team from the Jeffrey Bawa Trust who make all the arrangements for these visits. Thank you all of you for your work. I'm also extremely grateful to Mr. Miles Young, friend of the Trust, who for almost 15 years have made the travel of each of our speakers possible through his generous funding. On behalf of the Jeffrey Bava Trust, thank you, Miles, and hope you will be able to be here with us for our next speaker. And of course, to each and every one of you for being with us this evening. The Jeffrey Bava Trust Curator of Collections, Shari De Silva, will now introduce Sumaya. Thank you, Chairman. We are living in uncertain and challenging times. In these recent weeks here in Sri Lanka, we have been reminded of the vitally important value
was founded in 2014. Through both professional practice and research, Counterspace, in, I quote, explores the spatial tension within the city, as well as the oscillating membranes that shift and conflate geographies, making visible this tension between vast human needs and scarce resources. Her role as a teacher at the Graduate School of Architecture in Johannesburg is an intrinsic part of her practice. Here, she was also named in Time Magazine's list of leaders of the future, and she has recently worked on founding and developing support structures for support structures, a new fellowship program launched at a certain time. Sumeya serves on several boards through her interest in dynamic forms of archive and supporting new networks of knowledge in the arts. In April this year, Sumeya, alongside Saada Rashid, Omnia Abdelba, and Julian Raby, were named curators of the inaugural Islamic Arts Biennale. We are so delighted to have you here, Sumeya, in this extraordinary moment in Sri Lanka. Thank you, and over to you. Thank you so much. I know that this is not quite the live lecture that we imagined, but I am deeply grateful to be <laughs> sitting with all of you at the Jeffrey Bauer House itself, and also, I think that on this occasion, this intimate setting after the days that we spend together feels really, really fitting. And I'm incredibly humbled to be here, especially after hearing your moving words. Um, thank you so much for having me. So on the day that I arrived here, the city was incredibly silent. That silence arrived after a tumultuous storm. It is an incredible um, honor and deeply humbling to be present with you here in this important moment. We recognize these moments as important precisely because they open roads for new and different worlds to be imagined. This lecture is titled In Pieces, and it was penned at number 11, 33rd Lane, Colombo, on the eve of after the resignation of Mahinja Rajapaksa. It is an unpacking of my work through individual pieces but it is also a reflection on both the trials and the possibilities of dismantling things and the great work of social imagination required to put them back together anew. We have always been working on this. The theme of this lecture is listening to pieces of place in architecturally unlikely places. I would like to begin this lecture with a name calling of some of those who listened to our ancestors and to my generation those who made space for each other and who made space for us. In this tribe, we evoke ancestors near and far, friends and mythical figures, people who write, organize, imagine, and build worlds. The first five names on this list comprise of Sri Lankan artists who embodied a sustained struggle for freedom. The calling of their names invokes the calling of millions of errant, unrecognized other architects, past, present, and future. Ina De Silva, Lucky Sananayake, George Keat, Lionel Wendt, Barbara Sansoni, Maria Antebella Matlangu, Dina Matlangu, Martina Matlangu, Esther Matlangu, Octavia Butler, Steve Biko, David Ajay, Sarah Maldoror, Julie Meretu, Zaha Hadid, Balkrishna Doshi, Isama Noguchi, Malcolm X, Yasmin Lari, Claudia Jones, Maya Lin, Marina Tabassum, Leslie Loco, Eileen Gray, Ray Eames, Arundhati Roy, Lena Bobadi, Jean Claude, Valentine Gunasekra, Manette De Silva, Jeffrey Bauer. Sample John Kurika Taru, Seke, Bangorihe, Tisi Kilometer Ku, Kabasiba Uha Kain Swiss, Kay Abake, Kukma Kurus King Abanga Kesa, Kadiko Sep Taisa, Singa, Seke Eka, Kuning Uri Kriba, Bad Vatashland, Sejuanusper, Abe Bay, Tisi Taisa, Taisa Tisimani, and Kuriba Ho, Kaba Ho, Singa Kedi Atara. In this recording, Sana Swatboy is describing the origins of our city in her mother tongue, Ku, an endangered language in southern Africa. 
the origins of our city are fraught. In 2015 in South Africa, arguably the most significant uprising since the advent of democracy, young people in the country brought administration to its knees. It started with a symbol in the form of roads must fall, but quickly progressed to the underlying system in the form of fees must fall. I was a graduating architecture student at the time, and so Counterspace was founded at this very specific moment in South Africa's political landscape, and what has been coined the post-Rainbow Nation generation, an era of protest, frustrations, urgencies, collective awarenesses, and awakenings. In this context, Counterspace draws together a constellation of interests around the construction and imagination of belonging across territory and geography, looking at how people make our city, Johannesburg, a place to be held through ritual gatherings in the cracks of the urban environment at various scales, from the scale of the body to the scale of the cosmos. I am deeply inspired by place, and I am committed to searching to, for design languages for here. How many ways can we listen to the grounds beneath our feet? The earth of a place is a condensation and an overlaying of time, stories, field notes, excerpts, archaeologies, and forensic samplings. Architectural practice, research, and pedagogy present us with platforms to think through and respond to the inextricable connections between history, forces of labor, race and class struggles, capitalism, and climate change. Diverse origins and forms of practice that excavate and bring to light our deep pasts and deep futures are not novel or radical. They are implicit and imperative. Sometimes, calls from the ground are whispers, moments of the past that surface and interface with the present. Sometimes they are rhythms, heartbeats and rituals that we must heed. At other times, calls are loud, shouts of protest, rage, and calls for change, tear gas, gunshots, and ululating. But most often, we have to learn to listen to silences and absences, or rather, to read presences where we have been conditioned not to. Instead of a programmatic or chronological order, or arranging the works by scale, this presentation is structured through metaphors of the ground, from atmospheric dust to soil to clay to earth and grounding. Each theme presents an attempt to make territory through a different method, the atmospheric, the diasporic, the indigenous, and the ritual. When I was a little girl, my grandfather had a shop in inner city Johannesburg. It was the 1990s. South Africa was being born. I know now that it was a tumultuous time, but what I felt most keenly was the optimism that suffused the city's atmosphere. The first project I want to show you in a way reflects that complex spirit of the city. This project is a snapshot from a much longer, much larger body of work on Johannesburg's mine dumps. It's called Folded Skies. Acting in plan and in section, this condition of Johannesburg has produced a series of isolations, walls of varying degrees and thicknesses between people, and the physical displacement of bodies from lands. The Group Areas Act of 1950 in South Africa legislated on a broad front to regulate the presence of Africans in the urban areas. It gave local authorities the power to demarcate and establish African locations on the outskirts of white urban and industrial areas and to determine access to and the funding of these areas. This sedimented in legislation and planning that black people would live next to toxic areas, mine dumps and industrial buffer zones. On windy days, some townships are covered in yellow dust. Asthmatic complications and tuberculosis rise. Buffer zones for white people were zoos, parks, and trees. Part of this project developed through my ma master's thesis research in which I worked with the archaeological layers on mine dumps, microcosms of conditions in Johannesburg, social, historical, and atmospheric. 
Some of this work involved material research, extracting toxic inorganic pigments from the ground soil in an attempt to mediate and cleanse that ground soil. There is a myth in Johannesburg about our iridescent sunsets, said to be so because of specks of gold and other compounds in our city's dust. The same recycled compounds found in the mine waste dumps are used in this project to tint mirror surfaces, each aspect a different time of day. The shape, color, and materiality of this work became through the Joburg sunset. When it is clear, the Joburg sky moves gracefully and soundlessly through shades of all the colors you have never known. As the sun drops behind the horizon line at the end of the day, it looks idyllic. You want to touch it, hold it, never let it go, breathe in all of the magnificence. The amount of pollution, dust, and chemical particles in Joburg's air, produced by mining, creates a colorscape of refracted light and inorganic pigments that people will say is beautiful. The mirrors turn and fold, drawing together conditions of labor and extraction and wealth in the same frame. Made for Johannesburg's mine dumps and exhibited at Speerwein Estate in Stellenbosch, the work collects in a drop the atmospheric and the intangible. Its silence veils the unspoken consequences of beauty, so often created by decentralized labor and resource extraction. Project, Patch to Park Drive. Geographies from elsewhere root themselves in Johannesburg in this project. Straddling two urban with contrasting land uses and municipalities, a wholesale Chinese mall complex and a neighborhood layered with migrations, historic Indian and contemporary African foreign presences. Two speeds, two opens, two closes. Two languages and conversations from opposite ends of Asia. Land, stack, turn, overhang, slash, slice, clip, fasten, then fold into the site. Corrugated programs of leisure and trade. Monday to Sunday, truck reverses, goods are hauled, doors are lifted. Goods are slid in, stacked, tucked, door pulled down. But on Tuesday nights and every second Saturday, chairs slide out, tables are on casters, friends hug and go to the counter. A queue winds out, strawberry milkshakes all afternoon. Upstairs, an expanding plume of cigar smoke and the sound of a shaver. The barber is back from Bangladesh. Project, now, now. A place to wait is more than just a place to wait. For this project, brief from Uber to light up Joburg, we work to transform and expand the brief into, do you have a space to wait with dignity, a safe route to walk? a set of furniture pieces in extruded patterns that allow for seating, waiting, signage, shelter, wayfinding, and light. A series of Johannesburg vernaculars. One of them could become a pop-up museum. Another, a pop-up library, next to a space where someone is getting their hair braided. A set of soft micro-infrastructures on the street. Project, Pan-African Plates. This project looks at rituals surrounding food spaces and food practices in Johannesburg. Conceived as an installation for the Wuzhen Biennale in China, the project proposes a dinner table where visitors are invited to take a seat and share a meal with the person next to them, while reading recipes, traditions, and rituals from across Africa, hybridized by Yeovil, Johannesburg, which was the center of many xenophobic attacks in the country. Project, Brixton Mosque. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, five times a day. The church bells used to clang too, nine o'clock on Sundays. A cacophony, a melody, a new set of harmonies. Sunrise, sunset, the conversion of an old Dutch reformed church into a mosque. On Fridays, the new street edge is animated. Children climb, traders trade, people meet. A form emerges, a geometric merge between the old church arches and new parabolic orders. New and old, dreamers, wishers, worshippers from two religions and times. The architectures pray together, reveal and conceal, hide and seek, past, present, and future. Backlit nine millimeter translucent polycarbonate on 30 by 76 millimeter lightweight steel substructure, bolted to parapet of existing turret. Lights are switched on, 
This turns the church bell tower into a minaret, a minaret made of light that appears at only five times in the day. 250 millimeter translucent reinforced concrete monolithic arches to engineer spec. The second scheme, a refuge from the street. Project, Indivella Geometries. A landscape puzzle to learn about geometries, volumes, and mathematical uni universes. Deep time, kit of parts assembly, volume, indigenous algorithms and geometries. Click into place, snap, lock, dispatch, clip, stack, pack, unravel, reorder, unorder, mismanage, step up, totem, tessellate, assemble geometries into place. New platonic orders, other fundamentals. Location, mobile, from N Street Park, Hillbrow, to Spa Parking Lot, Corner Hospital Street, Limpopo. Lightweight interlocking stackable volumes, 300 by 300 by 200 millimeter thick, trihedron, triangulated, tessellated shapes in super dense injection molded expanded foam. Project, material histories. In this project, a set of paper architectures is made. A tablecloth, a paste up at a bus stop, and a shop front window. Each element contains a series of recipes. Important forms of archive, as they are maps of the movement of people across geography and time. They contain notes for how to make a dynamic and an evolving archive, carried from family to family, generation to generation, geography to geography. They are alive with the past and generous and interpretive with the present. Through a fold in time and a tear in space, it becomes possible for the difference of a thousand years, a thousand stories, a thousand meals, to rest layered, one and the same, collected within one person, one gesture, one ingredient. The exhibition lives as posters in the public spaces where these elements are found, marketplaces, restaurants, and shops, spaces of communal eating. A recipe fixed to a shop front window would show how intertwined we all are, why we do what we do, and why and who we hate and love and why. A note on the unconscious performances of histories. Project, fat wall. Protests, fees must fall. Traffic, cars, taxis, rain, sun. A very harsh campus edge for students. Walls, 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 fences, fire, gates. A two second boom delay. Watch out for spikes. Enter the fortress. From thick barren barriers into fat walls with functions. A mediator between the city and the school. A wall as a space, a two way street a cigarette seller, vending machines, new landscape set of infrastructures, lighting, seating, waiting, a 1.5 person seat for laptops, shopping, or a child, a soft warm glow at night, sheets of translucent luminescent concrete rise out of the ground, a tiny strip of lush green, fragrant lemon hydrangeas, and the smell of coffee and a 13 rand muffin. Project, children's rights. Politics is something that we learn. This means that the politics of the future can be different to the politics of the past and the politics of the present. But in order for that difference to be meaningful, it is important to know where we are in the present. This project in collaboration with Play Africa at the Con Constitutional Court in South Africa is an attempt to give access to the processes that mediate our relations with one another through play and performance. It has also subsequently been used to train children for the witness stand. Project, conversation rooms, the choreography of an academic conference, connecting the school and the street, discussions over a sharing table, infrastructures of intimacy, a set of spaces for the prompting and recording of conversations about architecture used in different contexts one-to-one, -one, a group discussion, a sharing circle, a solitary moment, or a date. Project, backstory, a shop front space for architecture and event, the discussion and perpetuation of ideas. A passerby sees a QR code for a hashtag MeToo mapping session. Stills from Baloji's new zombie film are projected from the space and into the alleyway. 
A movie poster, a soup kitchen, and a mini library are also spaces of the revolution. Project, Serpentine Pavilion, London, Kensington Gardens. If shelter is the most basic unit of architecture, then safety, belonging, and the idea of home are at the core of humanity's impulse to build. Architecture is about being together and about being apart, about placing together and taking apart, about forcing together and cutting apart, about making together and moving apart, about falling apart or standing together. Everywhere the ground is moving and we construct connections and disconnections between things. The ground in London comes from all over the world. Those who hold a belief in stable ground cling to it, not knowing that they are sinking. As the heart of a once global industrial empire, London is perhaps one of the most densely layered centers on earth. New arrivals can feel the ground moving and intuitively engage in grounding practices. This map draws 52 places important to the construction of community for many migrant communities in London. Placemaking persists across time and space, from ancient dwellings and rituals to the height of collective achievement in the world centers and also to the most meager or dire of the world's circumstances today. It is a manifestation of community and of hope, even in the absence of both. Home is how we locate ourselves, and as much as it extends beyond us, we also carry it within us. The 2021 Serpentine Pavilion is a response to and a celebration of this tapestry of stories and voices, drawing inspiration from underrated spaces of cultural production, among others, the British Mosque in London. the Centre Price Publishing House, the Four Aces Club in Dalston, the first venue to play black music in London, markets, local grocers and stores, places of worship in neighbourhoods with histories and presences of migrations, everyday places of belonging and of resistance. One of the most integral parts of this pavilion has been to extend its ethos at different scales and in different realms, to bring voices across times and geographies into dialogue. The pavilion is conceived in five pieces. These pieces take place all over London. The Tabernacle, New Beacon Books, The Albany, Valence House, and Kensington Gardens. Each piece is a small public offering, a shelf, a stage, a seat, a podium, and a table. They are seeds for collaborations between the Serpentine and the places that house them will hopefully last long beyond the summer. A shelf at New Beacon Books holds in its form traces of surrounding streets. It houses literature from the African diaspora and has a space for a person to sit and read in solitude or to an intimate audience. A stage for the tabernacle draws on its continued celebration of song, sound and street food. A seat at the Albany is an offering of rest, meeting, and organizing. Drawing on radio and media as important historic and contemporary spaces of belonging, a podium at the Valence Library continues the legacy of the Serpentine Civic Team's collaboration in Barking and Dagenham, and is now home to a radio station and its listening sessions, which we just launched at the end of last year. In honor of many voices, past, present, and future. One step back, we set our one half forward, and our one half back. We set our left side forward, and my right side back. Boss up left side, right side, half the change that we say. Half the revolution, the pun, the attack. Only half a solution to the things that we like, we say. If diaspora is the flow, there is also an ebb, a coming together. The structure in Kensington Gardens draws together stories and traces of places and gatherings which have carried communities. 
Across the summer, through listening to the city, voices from London were brought to the pavilion in the form of sound commissions with the Serpentine Civic and Education teams and the artists J. Bernard, Ayeen Bailey, and the Valence Library. The making of the pavilion itself has embodied collective acts of placemaking. Despite novel limits and impossibilities, the pavilion has emerged as a sum of many voices, of shared vision, and of community. Reflecting on the role of some of the spaces, past and present, that hold communities, we are reminded of our reliance on the tireless generosity of people and spaces that dare to bring about difference. Not only did these spaces provide physical space for gathering, but they also offer us alternatives for what institutions can look like and how they can function. For example, one of the references, the mangrove, held the presences of mother tongues, food, sounds, and atmospheres. A space for different movements, like the Notting Hill Carnival, or the interest around the West Indian Gazette to, to thrive and grow. Many of these spaces are reliant on the generosity of people who hold these spaces for coming together and seeding change. As a long-term legacy of the pavilion and building on the work of the Serpentine Civic team, Support Structures for Support Structures is a fellowship with ambitions to work to seed and support alternative structures through the support of London-based cultural producers who are working at the intersection of art and social justice, art and ecology, and art and the archive. It is an opportunity to listen deeply to and to seed and support different networks and bodies of knowledge in the arts. These individuals and voices that have come together around the pavilion have done so far beyond what I could have imagined. We are convened by buildings and by building alike. Um, John LaRose made connections with all sorts of people um, from different countries across his political and cultural um, passions really and his commitment to justice, social justice across everywhere that had been colonized basically and the books really reflect that in terms of Africa, the Caribbean and Asia. So we're really happy to be hosting this event. Um, and it was very exciting when Natalia, who is here this evening from the Serpentine, first came into the shop when Nicole and I were working um, on a busy day and introduced herself and told us about this whole project with Samea Valley, who I'm also really pleased is here this evening. Um, really, really exciting. And the idea of doing um, the pavilion, creating the pavilion, with inspiration about London's black community was something that really resonated with us and we were so excited, Nicole and I were like, yes, we definitely want to do this. And um, when Michael and Janice heard about it, of course, they were delighted too. And particularly so because of the different locations that Samay has um, drawn inspiration from in terms of the pavilion. And what I, when I went to visit, I really liked the idea that it was something that people were enjoying. They weren't just looking at it as a work of art, they were actually, kids were playing on it, people were drinking, they were chatting, they were climbing through it. And of course, we are delighted that we have a piece of it here. In the same way that the idea of home is owned, shared, and transmitted through community, so too, this building exists through those who have inspired and come together to build something that belongs to them. It has sparked initiatives and ideas that will far outlive the finite duration of the commission, and the making of a building does not end with the completion of construction. Building is also a verb, and it is through living, breathing, and sharing space that a building is continuously completed. Project, Sunday Rice Ritual. Translating the spirit of the pavilion into small scale domestic objects of gathering for the Serpentine's limited edition series, Sunday Rice Ritual consists of a series of 20 plates that come together to form a gathering table. A social sculpture which draws on the rituals of coming together to prepare and share a communal meal. Each plate also connects its, cu its custodian in a gathering with 19 other plates. In the purchase of this plate, one's email address is shared with 19 others who belong to the same gathering. But three plates belong to fellows from the Pavilion's Support Structures for Support Structures program. And the intent in this is to connect young artists with those who have purchased 
expensive plates, potentially people who are interested in commissioning artworks. Project, Notting Hill Procession. In this project, continuing through the legacy of the Serpentine Pavilion and building on a relationship with the al artist Alvaro Barring Belling sorry, Barrington and the Tabernacle, the fragment of the pavilion housed at the Tabernacle starts to develop a set of companions. The roots of the Notting Hill Carnival that took shape in the mid-1960s had two separate but connected strands. The Caribbean Carnival was held on the 30th of January, 1959, in St. Pancras Town Hall as a response to the problematic state of race relations at the time. The Notting Hill race riots in which 108 people were charged and which had occurred just the previous year. The 1959 event held indoors and televised by the BBC was organized by Trinidadian journalist and activist Claudia Jones, who is often described as the mother of the Notting Hill Carnival. She did this in her capacity as editor of the influential black newspaper, the West Indian Gazette, and it showcased elements of Caribbean carnival in a cabaret style. It featured, among many other things, the mighty terror singing the Calypso, carnival at St. Pancras, the Southlanders, Cleo Lane, the Trinidadian All-Stars, and Hi-Fi Steel Band's dance troupe, finishing with a Caribbean Carnival Beauty Queen contest and a grand finale jump up by West Indians who attended the event. As the carnival had no permanent staff and head office, the Mangrove Restaurant in Notting Hill became that. It came to function as an informal communication hub and office address for the carnival's organizers. Designed as a procession that will come together over the course of the week, a series of fragments will be created each draws on a different geography or mythology associated to carnival, then hybridized by Notting Hill vernaculars. Over the week, the pieces will be carried in procession, each of them in collaboration with the community organization and in honor of carnival elders. At the end of the week, the pieces come together as a stage. They have an inherently diasporic logic. They function together and apart inform each other and recognizably are from the same family, but they also develop resonances with their contexts, near and far. I began this lecture with a love letter to our ancestors, and I would like to end it with a love letter to our futures. Dear younger architects, all the definition of architects that we have, there is always architecture waiting to happen in places that are overlooked. You will soon fall in love with gold, kitsch, supernatural ideas, with very strange and everyday things. A disco church on wheels in the inner city, the performance of a ritual gathering on a patch of felt grass of a traffic island next to a highway, the rhythms and space of an Ethiopian coffee ceremony, the smell before a high felt thunderstorm, the choreography of Fordsburg on a Friday before, during, and after prayer time the specific color spectrum of a mind dump sunset, the tenacity of indigenous plants and indigenous ceremonies and practices, all the magic that is the city. There is another canon here. Ingest atmospheres, learn how to read and feel color, dust, mist, the phases of the moon. There is another canon here. Look at these things deeply, feel them, absorb them. You will soon develop a mistrust for the historical record. Listen to that. Look so deeply at what is present that you notice the silences and the absences too. There is another canon here in these silences and absences. Read in other languages. Write in your mother tongues. Look deeply at sentence structure and vocabulary. There is another canon here. Learn how to dissect the index of an archive and how to make your own indexes for archives. Stay soft and sensitive. It is a deep strength and architecture needs it. Do not let anyone tell you otherwise. Don't listen to anyone who tells you that everything you can ever imagine has already been done. They are incorrect. Beauty and social justice are not mutually exclusive. Beauty is social justice. There are an infinity of untold stories, unheard voices, unrealized dreams, and undreamt worlds. 
Poetry is a necessity, and dreaming is everything. Thank you. Thank you, Sumaya. That was just wonderful mm -hmm. and so, so timely. Um, I'm going to invite the audience who's on YouTube to uh, share questions. Um, and if our audience here has any questions, we're happy to take them. Um, but maybe just while everyone gathers their thoughts and um, you've given us a lot to think about and dwell on, I wonder if you might speak. Um, one of the things that really struck me in your conversation was um, the different times that you work with. I think as much as you work in different media, I think time is almost one of your mediums. Um, could you speak a little bit more about, um, and I think the way you also use rhythm and sequence and all of those are elements of time. Um, do you think a lot about the relationship between space and time? Um, is that one of the th is that something you're working on very consciously? Yes, and yesterday when we were at Lunuganga, um, Channa actually said that the garden is made with time. The most important ingredient is time. Um, and I think on a, let's say on a philosophical level, there's also something really interesting that that thought left me with. Um, I recently heard the photographer James Barner say that societies flourish when people plant seeds for which they will never rest underneath the shade. And I think that's something really conscious that I work towards in my practice. You mentioned that teaching and pedagogy is a very important part of the practice, research and curatorial work also. And I think that engagement with a kind of deeper past and a deeper future that we are, might not necessarily be present in is really important. And at the same time as we do have temporal projects um, as we have and we make platforms to build and experiment and test those questions boldly. I think it's equally as important to have and to protect a space for experimentation and for the slow work um, mm -hmm. of the next generation and the past generation to, to really sit and develop um, so that those things start to also feed into our present work. Otherwise, I think we become too trapped um, by the, by the issues and the challenges we have, because we all have so many, and allowing ourselves to sometimes work at that longer pace and to have that in mind um, is really important. It is, you know, in the words of many brilliant and prolific authors, it's, it's the work, um, that is the real work. Everything else is just a distraction. That our, it's our, the function is working. But thank you. Those are, those are amazing words. And I think um, somebody's just fielding in a question. Okay, so we, say, um, we have Rani Three who says, You speak of canons at the end of your presentation. How would you say that canons are changing in your architectural practice? Is it architecture or an integration of multiple forms of practice? Thank you so much for the question. What's the name? Rani Three. Rani Three. Thank you so much for the question. And it's a very interesting and pertinent one. Um, and I think absolutely we need to be integrating other disciplines, especially now. But I think that's something that our cities have been telling us for a long time and our conditions have been telling us for a long time. Um, when we were talking about the protests, you mentioned how many disciplines were involved. We talked about artists, the creation of projections, rituals. Those are all really important forms of space making. And I think if we listen to other ways of being, there are so many knowledges locked in these other forms. And in architecture in particular, um, it's so easy to concentrate and focus on architecture as being the static only, but in so many other ways of being, I think there are other ingredients 
um, that really contribute to the making of this of a space uh, through atmosphere, through forms of dress, through ritual, um, through processions, and so on. And I think that even if those are not the final outcome of the architecture, they are injecting something into our tools and our ways of thinking. And I hope that by integrating them, we're also working to push the discipline forward. Because in a way, I think our conditions and our cities are far ahead of the architectures that we have. Okay. Um, I think we have room for a couple more questions if our audience wants to um, drop them in. Any questions? I think you've used metaphors really elegantly to describe the work and presumably they're, they're developing quite organically. But do you have do you know where they do you ever know where they're going? Are there metaphors you'd like to work with in the future? Is it um, something that comes to you? Um, I don't know if I think of them in metaphors. I think when I talk about making ground and working archaeologically with layers, I really see it as that. Um, and uh, they are recurring themes, but they all point to the same things. And so um, metaphors for the ground, something that I use quite often, making of ground, um, marking of territory, making of place through ritual. Um, I think there are so many, as I said, other bodies of knowledge and other ways of being that have different approaches to how we think about, for example, ownership of land or monetary systems. I think even bigger questions can be thought through in architectural terms. So I hope that it's an ever-expanding lexicon of things to look at and work with because there are inspirations everywhere. We have another question from Anuradha where she says, thank you for this talk, Sumaya, which lifts us up. I am interested in the ways we teach and learn about the connections between land and architecture. Can you speak more about this? Um, it's a very big, deep question. I think that it's becoming increasingly important for us to really work with all the links between all of the forces that are embodied in land. And that means that we think deeply about, of course, ecology and the planet, um, that we think about how that is connected to forces of labor, to race and class struggle, to forms of extraction, to social justice. The question of climate, I think there's much more awareness now, is of course deeply linked to questions of everything. Um, but I think in South Africa in particular, for a long time, when students wanted to be apolitical, they would make a landscape project. And what can be more political than land? Um, and perhaps I think in that intuition, that also tells us something about kinds of work. There are two kinds of project. One is a deep engagement and a listening to and a dialogue with land. And the other is projecting onto and a silencing. And I think if we are not listening, no matter what we are doing, we are silencing something. Thank you. One more from Larissa who says, can you develop a bit on the methods you use to observe all the aspects of performance you mentioned in your projects? Um, thank you so much for the question. So the developing methods for working is something that's ongoing and continuous in the studio. And I think as much as we see a pen as something to draw with, we see film, we see sound, we see the collection of uh, ground samplings and toxins and you know laboratory work, all of these things as very important drawing methods. Um, and there's nothing, there's, there's no more powerful drawing tool than being in a place, I think and learning how to work with and absorb and then transmit the information of a place is an ongoing project. Um, so I don't, I don't have an exact answer, but it's something that we're continuously working on and working to expand in the studio. So. 
And from Sean, we say we have, thank you so much. Architecture has historically been constructed around the eye and the, um, he says the eye and the eye. Um, can you further discuss how architecture can move beyond the individual or institution? I think um, in many ways, if we think about, I mean, I, architecture is about the eye and it's seen as being about the eye, but there are so many forms and forces that come together to make a project that even if it is seemingly about the eye, it's never really about that. Even, I think, to draw on and call on ancestors, which we all do in various and varying ways, um, is also an integration of many others into our works. And the more that we're able to also acknowledge that um, and draw on beings and bodies that, are, that might be relevant for thinking about the future differently, um, the more collaborative our works will naturally become. Also, even I think in the present and in thinking about how we can be more interdisciplinary now. Um, of course, architecture, yes, I think, is very much trapped in the realm of the eye. Um, and I think there are many attempts in my own work and my own practice and many ambitions to also move it towards being about many, many senses. I think the time that we're in and the cities that we're in also naturally afford themselves or naturally afford us the opportunity to think much more deep senses um, because they really are multi-sensory. And again, indigenous knowledges and practices, the creation of spaces through different ways of being, so often we're not just about the eye. The eye is important, but as important as all the senses. Thank you, and I think we have room for maybe one more question if anyone has. And it seems like maybe we don't. Um, thank you very much for being here. As we've said, it's very, very meaningful for us to have you here and deliver this lecture at this time. And I know that this will be a conversation that we will continue. Thank I you. hope so. Thank you Definitely. so, so much. Thank you.